Good morning to everyone. I hope everyone is doing okay. This session is a, it's about if you are a AWS developer or professional, like how you think of migrating to Azure, not migrating rather, it's how you shift to Azure. That's that's the main topic. Most of the guys who are done Azure, uh, AWS in their careers, so they want to shift to Azure. What are the key mappings that you need to you know, think first. That is the objective of this session. And so if you know a little bit about AWS, I think it's very really easy for you all to grasp this because uh, as you know, most of all the cloud vendors have the same set of services with different names, different uh, little bit of uh, architectural differences, but uh, most, of, most of the vendors have in the same set of components conceptually, right? So it's very easy if you know one cloud uh, to shift to the other cloud if you know one cloud pretty well but if you don't know much about cloud i think it might be a bit technical but i'll do my best to you know explain whatever i can whenever it goes but it's it's a bit of a lengthy session i hope i can cover within 30 minutes unless i will have to get uh, 10 to uh, 5 to 10 minutes more right so let's start the session and uh, so as you know that AWS started IAS when as started as IAS when in 2006 and uh, they were the first to come to the market and uh, since then they have been uh, the number one uh, cloud vendor IAS cloud vendor and uh, I think for about now 15 years or so so but Azure came into the picture around 2008 and they have been uh, doing pretty well since then and if you check the Every year uh, performances, I think Azure is bridging the gap really well. Now I think be a very big challenge for AWS in the near future. But at the moment, uh, AWS is leading quite margin actually. I don't have the real statistics, but it's, it's not that close, but we'll be close in the future. So, so it's always good to uh, know multiple clouds because multi-cloud is a big buzzword these days mainly because it's uh, if you stuck to one cloud always it's uh, you have been locked to the, the particular cloud forever so it's always uh, good to have a b plan so that's why the multi-cloud comes to picture for example like mostly the bigger companies actually if one cloud goes on for at least one day let's say aws goes down for one day or so, so they don't have business for one day so if that's the case you have to you know for, fail over to a different cloud. So that, I mean, if everything goes down, I mean, if you, if one region goes down, okay, you can always shift to the other region, but everything goes down as a issue there. So when it comes to availability, so that's why most uh, big companies uh, move into this multi-cloud aspect, not only Azure, I mean, can be Google as well. And uh, so if, uh, if a cloud, rather than you know, sticking to one vendor, you can always uh, fall back to another cloud. That's in a very that's at the at the failover level. But if certain sometimes at department levels, you sometimes you find certain departments are having one vendor and other departments will have another vendor. So when you want to you know stitch to this to this cloud, some and again the multi cloud comes to the picture, right? And uh, that's why the importance of knowing uh, multiple cloud is uh, very important. Not 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 only vendor driven development failover aspect is a big thing. Right, as you know, it's uh, AWS came first and uh, Azure came second, right? And uh, according to the Gartner, the number one research company in the world, uh, AWS and uh, Azure and uh, Google are the leaders. Google was behind uh, some time ago. Now they are part of the leader quadrant, which you can see the right top. Uh, you can see all three vendors. This is the latest uh, quadrant in 2020 August, actually. This year's uh, one was not released yet. So you can see the leaders are there. You can there's substantial lead from AWS, but this gap is uh, narrowing down since last, I mean, last few years. So it's because Microsoft is doing pretty well in their marketing and support aspect, and they're trying hard to, you know, get to that uh, AWS level. The only thing is AWS is mutual mature when it comes to uh, their infrastructure, right? And, uh, but AWS Azure is not far behind, right? When it comes to Google, actually, Google is a different, uh, different proposition altogether because they are more developer friendly cloud it's not the same strategies what aws and azure is following it's a you know, if you say if you're a true developer i think you more enjoy working in google than any other cloud so it's more of a developer friendly cloud so they have a different strategy altogether but when it comes to infrastructure and the storage and other aspects technological landscape that's with that i think aws and azure are going in the same direction Right. 
Um, so as I said, uh, in IAS market, IAS past market actually, it, Amazon, Microsoft, and Google are the leaders. But uh, when you take the SaaS, SaaS market, I think uh, Microsoft is the number one uh, because there are so many SaaS products, right? And uh, AWS strength is not SaaS. They are, they are more into IAS and PaaS actually. So if you take SaaS, I think Microsoft have uh, over, they have beaten even Salesforce now. So. Even even Google search about the best SaaS product, it's a Microsoft at the moment. So, but today's topic is not about SaaS; it's about IAS and PaaS actually, in terms of vendor-driven uh, cloud. And uh, so, its uh, leaders are Amazon, Microsoft, and Google, right? And uh, when it comes to infrastructure, I mean, uh, there are these are the latest figures. In AWS, you find 25 regions and 81 availability zones, but uh, this can change even next week. So this is the latest from the site, right? So if you take uh, Azure, it's uh, if you compare these two, you can see uh, Azure is more almost double the regions of AWS. I I, I I tried my best to get the exact number, but uh, apparently the numbers are missing from site. So these are the rough uh, figures from around five to six months ago. This number could could have been changed, but I was not able to get the right numbers, right? But it's 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 actually uh, very surprisingly, it's uh, infrastructure-wise, uh, Azure has more regions and more variability zones. It shows that they are in a full drive to, you know, make things stable in all the countries. For example, their target is to, you know, have their regions in almost all the countries that they represent, right? I don't know whether Sri Lanka will get one, but hopefully we'll get one in the future as well, because we have a representation in Sri Lanka as well. But uh, when it comes to AWS, yeah, their infrastructure is comparatively half Azure. So network side, I think what I see is Azure is doing well, right? And uh, But the, uh, when it comes to uh, maturity and the storage wise, I think AWS is far ahead. And they're faster in their performance. They have better mechanisms to manipulate all the storage aspects, right? That's their strength. And they've been doing it for a long time. And uh, But that doesn't mean it does cash you can't match them up, but they will definitely. And uh, so when it comes to uh, AWS and Azure, there are subtle differences. You know, when, you, when you go through the slide deck, I mean, uh, most of the components will be the same. But whenever there's a set difference, I talk about it, right? And I will, most of the slides, will, I will not have AWS slides because uh, this is this this session for as you are like wanting to shift into Azure from AWS. So if you have done AWS, it's very easy to shift to Azure, and uh, that is the objective. So most of the slides are based on Azure, but you can always map to the other component. I have a I have table structures to you know map all that, right? And uh, so if you talk about this this slide is Azure. If we talk about the regions, availability zones, and the uh, availability zones, I mean, if you know about AWS, in, in, in any region, you find availability zones, right? Uh, you heard about that, that there are minimum three availability zones in uh, AWS for a particular region. Uh, but that that is not the same in Azure. Azure, you can have regions without even availability zones. But uh, but there's a only marked difference is you find availability sets in Azure, which you don't find in uh, AWS, right? And uh, you find availability zones and regions, but not availability sets. But availability set is, it has 99.95 uh, uh, availability. And uh, if you take you take a system without availability zones, no, for example, if you have availability zones, multiple availability zones, you have availability, 99.99 but if you don't have if you have a single availability zone it means you have 99.9 so if you want to have uh, somewhere in the middle uh, availability like 99.995 or something you need to have availability sets availability set is all about having a replication within within a single region right not for example if you store something if everything goes to the same rack even if you have multiple copies if the rack goes off your system will go off. The availability set will do what they make sure that uh, you don't store the same copy in the same rack. It will be copied into those different racks in the same data center. But it's in the same data center, right? 
and uh, you can see this availability set. It's, it's uh, so these all verticals are called racks, right? I mean, if you if you have three copies of one one instance, you have three copies into three different racks. So that's called availability set. When you are creating a virtual machine, you can select which availability set that you want to put. So likewise, you can make sure that uh, redundancy and failover aspect is made sure in the within the data center, not 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 across the data centers, it's within the data center, but uh, different racks altogether. Those are called four domains, right? And uh, so that's a, that's a that's a good uh, improvement they have done in as far as the failover aspect in clouds, which you don't find that in AWS, right? And uh, other than that, uh, you have things called sovereignty. You know, I mean, Azure was able to win the US government deal some time ago. So they have the separate public cloud for US. And, uh, and they have one for China as well. And they are coming up with other countries as well. Mainly in the government, it's uh, when you talk about the government, is uh, very secure, this thing. Right? You know, we can see every day people are trying to hack government websites because that's how they come into government sensitive data but that's why it's uh, even if it's a, you know it's a, when it's a public cloud it's all vulnerable it's always vulnerable right that's why even these cloud vendors are you know isolating those government clouds right so as you won the deal of us government so they have a separate cloud for us and even china but the thing is uh, china's azure public cloud is not managed by sorry azure it's managed by one of their technology partners called 21 Radio. 21 why not right and uh, but it's uh, infrastructure is owned by azure but they don't have any visibility of what's happening there right it's mainly because of the privacy issues and all stuff so it's uh, those are called for souring regions i mean i mean we can't use them it's, uh, it's for all government related stuff other than those regions we can access most of the regions right when it comes to when you start using azure i think it, when you compare aws and azure is free tires are different right uh, when it comes to Azure, you get 200 credits for for a month, right? When you when you when you when you start using Azure, you can input your credit card and you can use that uh, system for a month uh, for free, and you can uh, utilize 200 dollars within that month, right? For free, you can use all the services without any issue. There's no there's no limit of using any of the, but you can go up to only 200 dollars, but for a month. So if you want to start experimenting i think this is a good start but you don't find that in aws aws is uh, they have multiple free tire 12 months free stuff and uh, always free stuff but uh, you don't get this kind of a ceiling figure for a month or so but azure has and uh, so after one month again after 12 months you have uh, multiple free services in azure right and that's their model of uh, free tire and uh, after 12 months also there are to be free services available. But after a month, if you say you finish your $200, it does not automatically charge your credit card. It will ask you whether you want to proceed. That's a good thing about Azure, which you don't find many, many, many vendors. They automatically pass the bill to you, but this, this Azure does not do that. They make sure that you get, get the consent from you, then only they'll go to the pay as you go model, right? Once you upgrade your model, pay as you go model, you will charge for what you use. Actually. And there are other support plans. Uh, there are three more plans, standard developer and uh, professionals, based on the support you get. For example, if you want to have eight hour support, you go to the developer one. If you want the standard support, you get 24 seven. For the professional, you get then and their support. But they are pretty costly, but uh, comparatively developer is much cheaper with eight hour support. Uh, working hours. Uh, that's good enough, actually. Uh, I think it's $100 or something, I can't remember. And uh, so uh, that's uh, Azure support. When it comes to AWS, as I said, uh, they have three levels. There are 12 months. Uh, so, so, I mean, if you go to the website, you can, the URL is given, you can see, check all these uh, 12 months are always free and uh, free trial services. For example, you see to 750 hours for particular instance types. The S3 5G PRDS 750 hours, AP Gateway 1 million, likewise, and always free like DynamoDB 25 GB, always free, Lambda 1 million per month, right? 
SNS 1 million cloud facilities. I mean, you can go to this website and see all these free tile offers. But it's different to Azure. AWS is, uh, you don't have the ceiling value of 200 or anything. They just, from this day you start, you get these free services, but you'll be charged for whatever you use extra, what you, I mean, if you use more than this free tile stuff, you'll be charged. So it's a bit different. Azure has a different way of doing things. So definitely two different vendors, they have to be different, right? And uh, so uh, the other difference you find is, uh, when you create an account in AWS, for example, you when you create an account, you, if you are created the account, you are the root admin, and you can have multiple admins under you, but uh, the only difference between root admin and the other service admins are this uh, root admin can basically visualize billing aspect, right? That's very simple architecture. I mean, it's very easy to understand, there's no, complexity behind it, but when it comes to Azure, it's a bit complex. It's, it's uh, uh, because they have multiple administrators, account administrator, root admin. Service admin is just similar to the AWS admin, uh, but admin in the sense when you create an AWS uh, root account and you can create admins, right? something similar to service, service administrator in Azure. But there are things called co-administrators in Azure, which you can have up to 200 co-administrators. So all these administrators can do whatever service creations, deletions and all, but the only thing, the content administrator is the only one who has the billing billing capacity. I mean, he's the one who can manage billing, you can transfer, you can create service admin, you can create core administrator, you can shift uh, service administrator to other service subscription and all stuff. So account admin is the key person, but the service administrator and core administrator can do the same thing What uh, when it comes to administration of these resources, you can do the same. The only thing is billing is, uh, uh, not there, right? So don't worry too much about this administrative stuff, but uh, uh, it's uh, similar to AWS. Only thing is there's a thing called these co-administrators and uh, service administrators at this level, right? And uh, as I said, this if you look at this diagram, you can see AWS is very simple architecture in that sense. You have a co-account owner which does handle all the resources within it, but then it comes to uh, Azure, there are multiple levels of admins. So I'm not going to that detail because it's a different topic altogether. But remember that uh, it's different. So it's not the same. And the other thing is Azure billing happens through subscriptions, right? Even if you create an Azure account, you can have multiple subscriptions, right? For example, by default, you have a single subscription, but you can create subscriptions. So creating a subscription means you can have multiple billing accounts. So for example, if you are creating uh, an account for on BT, you can have multiple subscriptions for different departments. So you find that in AWS also, you call AWS organizations, but in AWS organizations, uh, AWS, uh, the master account will have the billing authority to you know, do that. So he's the one who pays the bill, but it's different in Azure. Uh, it's a uh, subscription base. The different subscriptions uh, can have different billing aspects. Uh, you can change the account payments uh, whenever you want. So it's different. And uh, so that's it. I just show you a bit of subscriptions. I mean, you can look at this. Uh, this is my account actually. And uh, you can have multiple subscriptions. And by default, I am in this default subscription. But if you move to other one, it's different, right? Subscriptions are totally different. Right, uh, different hierarchies, different resourcing, and all stuff, right? And uh, uh, so we'll come back to that later. And uh, so when it comes to uh, uh, roles and uh, roles, actually, AWS, as, as you know, that uh, we have multiple policies, right? You have uh, resource level policies and you have identity policies. Similar in uh, AD, uh, Azure as well, you find Azure roles and Azure AD roles. Azure AD is also actually the identity policies, that identity roles or policies rather. And Azure roles is uh, something is called resource-based policies. So it's a bit different. And uh, mind you that Azure has a strong identity management system. I'm not going to into detail. It's a different topic altogether. Very strong compared to uh, AWS. AWS is just an identity management system they have. But when it comes to Azure AD, it's very mature. You've been there for a long time, and they have plugged that uh, Azure AD into multiple domains. For example, 
you can use the same AD for Azure and you can same use the same AD for Office 365 as well. Right? I mean, it's federated nicely and it's nicely uh, architected, right? So uh, these Azure AD roles, actually, you can use the same AD role for multiple domains, right? Because they have a product suite to do that, because they have 365 product suite and they have Azure product suite, right? And uh, so it's different. But uh, if you take Azure roles, that means it's only to manage resources within Azure, not in 365. But when it comes to Azure AD roles, you can go even up to 365 also, right? And uh, so this actually this uh, diagram, one of my diagram is from the Azure site. You can clearly see that uh, Azure AD roles at the top, which can govern anything, and it comes to identities. It comes to Azure roles is something to find identity within Azure. So within Azure, you can find subscriptions. So you can you know manipulate subscriptions based on the Azure roles or Azure AD roles. I mean you know in AWS. When it comes to resource policies and when it comes to identity policies, you can have, you can select either one or you can have a combination of both. You can have hybrid authentication authorization. In here also, you can do the same. You can have hybrid authentication authorization. Right? And uh, so, as I said, uh, billing happens through subscriptions in Azure. So within a subscription, you find things called resource groups. It's another new thing that you find in Azure, which you don't find in AWS. I'll uh, come back to that. And uh, on top of that, uh, you can see on, on top of subscriptions, you find management groups. Right? Management groups are actually another entity that you can manage multiple subscriptions. So as I said, uh, within uh, within a Azure account, you can have multiple subscriptions. So you can have multiple, uh, if, you are, if you are planning to manage subscriptions, let's say you want to have a, a policy, policy in the sense you can have authentication operations and policies, to both subscription using a management group, right? Something similar to AWS organization, like, like a master account. You know, a CP service control policy in uh, AWS, just similar, similar to that, you can have management group on the top, you can manage multiple subscription at the top. So within subscription, there are things called resource group, which you don't find in AWS. It's a good, a good concept, actually. For example, like if you are planning to, let's say you're planning to uh, develop a web application, so if you are planning to have all these uh, resources within uh, web applications, you can create a resource group and you can plant all these resources within that resource group. That means it's an isolated area, a logical isolated area, not a physical one. And uh, which means that uh, whatever you say, let's say you create a web application, you have a front end and you go back and whatever components you put in the resource group. So whenever you want to delete that application, you can, you can go and delete the resource group, everything will be deleted. So you don't find that in AWS. You find the tagging in AWS, right? You, when you when you want to isolate certain environments, you tag it. Sometimes uh, in such a case, it's very difficult to you know uh, govern that, right? Unless you tag it properly. So, but this is more or less when you're creating a VM or something. You, <clears throat> for example, a VM, right, you have to select which resource group it goes to, right? And uh, so that means that. Uh, Oh, you are forced to, you know, I mean, when you are tagging uh, AWS service, you sometimes you ignore the tagging, right? You just go without tagging. But here you have to select the resource group. That means you have to do that. So that means if you are de developing an application, you, you are part of a resource group. That means always you can demarcate your applications really well. That's a very good uh, architectural uh, demarcation that you find between Azure and AWS, right? So all these uh, resources within a resource group. And one thing is, uh, you can have uh, other thing is uh, when you when you let's say uh, uh, there's no like. Uh, I mean, when you come to AWS, you find you can select regions, right? That's not, that's nothing like that in uh, uh, Azure. You select region when you're creating, uh, let's say you say virtual machines, you create a virtual machine. They are then and there, you select the region. But you can't, you know, select drop down and, you know, select the region. So that's one uh, difference you find, right? And, uh, and, uh, 
So even when you are creating a resource group, there, there can be resources of multiple regions as well. For example, that particular, let's say you are load balancing something, so you certain of certain component could be in another region within the resource group. So that that you, this is a very big difference that I find uh, in both consoles actually, and you know, can't select the region within the console, right? You, the region when you're creating a resource, you have to select the region and go, right? So that's a big difference, right? So I said the Azure subscription is similar to Azure Workflow. these organizations. It's a billing billing demarcation, and uh, as I said, managed group management groups are basically on top of subscription to manage subscriptions. Resource groups, as I said, uh, uh, is a logical grouping a container to you know have resources within it, and uh, each resource can be in only one resource group. You can't be in different multiple resource group. Uh, you can add or delete resource at any time. You can move resource from one resource group to another without any problem. Resource in multiple regions can be in one resource group. You can give user level access to resource group, blah, blah, blah. There are so many things you don't need to know. But uh, uh, in AWS, uh, you don't find the subscription stuff, right? You find uh, organizations, right? And uh, Whenever you want to have multiple departments or multiple entities, you create an organization and plug into the master account, and master account will handle the billing. Right? You can invite or create your own organization, right? And uh, and uh, permissions are controlled through not no management group through service control policies. Although you get the maximum service control policy on top, then you run through uh, member accounts through uh, fine grained policies, right? So it's a totally different structure altogether when it comes to Azure and AWS, when it comes to billing and uh, management of resources. So there's a very big difference, actually. I mean, it comes to Google, it's totally different again. And But uh, so these are, I mean, I know the concepts are same, but the thing is, in the console, the resource management aspects are two different, uh, in two different ways of doing. I mean, it's OK. I mean, I mean, you don't have to be the same, right? And uh, right. So that's more or less a resource management, how you, you know create subscriptions and all the stuff. But when it comes to networking, as you know that uh, I run through these areas because uh, you can can clearly see the mapping between these services. And uh, for if you find AWS service, there's a service in Azure as well. So when it comes to VPCs, you know virtual private cloud in AWS is called virtual network in Azure. And you want to uh, connect to uh, on-premise, you use UPN Gateway. The same name is there. Route 53 is a bit different, uh, but uh, when it comes to Azure, there are multiple components. In uh, You know, Route 53 can handle DNS. Plus, you can create a domain. You can register a domain. You can create hosted service, hosted uh, zones, and all that. You can do any everything in Route 53. But in Azure, there are multiple components. Right? DNS creation will be handled through DNS service, and traffic manager will do the traffic. And other differences, uh, you can't create domains in Azure. That's, that thing is not there yet. So for example, if you want to create your own domain, you can do in 253 without any problem. With a few seconds, not few seconds, few minutes, you can create a domain and you can host your domains. And you can even do the traffic uh, routing through you know, multiple area codes, or blah, blah, blah. But the thing is, uh, it's a bit different in Azure. And you mainly the thing is you can't create domains, right? That 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 will be added later. I think at the moment it's not there, right? Uh, as you know, the Direct Connect is the private line of uh, each uh, cloud vendor. Direct Connect is AWS. Express Route is the name given to Azure, right? When it comes to layer four load balancing, we have in AWS we call network load balancing. Layer seven application load balancing. Same in Azure, load balance is called layer four, application gateway is called layer seven, right? And uh, when it comes to security groups, uh, the name given to Azure is called network security group, same thing, only the name is different, right? But you don't find this application security group in AWS. AWS has a security group, but not application security group. This is another thing that uh, something something similar to resource group, but it's, it's a logical again thing. Let's say you want to have a web components uh, 
put into the same uh, security uh, architecture, for example, when it comes to routing, you, you can you know uh, isolate those stuff. Having a, another security group, for example, like when you create two resources, say you create two resources, two VMs, but you want to put it to the same uh, cluster. So if you create applicant security group, you can apply this application security group to both. Right? It's it's something logical demarcation that uh, you can you know uh, is another logical grouping that helps you to group application layers, web tier, database tier, and all that. So. It's not that very important, but it's a good thing when it comes to just something like resource groups, right? As I said, uh, I mean, if you find connected options in AWS, you find uh, site to uh, point to site, site to site, uh, uh, dedicated lines, and uh, normal VPN connections. Pairing connections means you know, from one VPN to the other, right? And uh, same thing in Azure as well, different names. Uh, you find this uh, site to uh, point to site, site to site, and Azure uh, Express Route stuff, right? The traffic manager, I said, it's uh, similar to Route 53. The only thing is it does not have the DNS registration in it, right? Right, compute, right? Compute actually, uh, uh, you know, in compute in uh, virtual machine for EC2 in AWS, Azure, we have Azure virtual machines, different names, same concept. Uh, Container-wise, you find ECS target in AWS. You find container instances in Azure, same thing, different name. Uh, ECR in container registry in AWS. Uh, same container registry name is in Azure. EKS in AWS, AKS in Azure. App Mesh in uh, AWS, Service Fabric Mesh in uh, Azure. Uh, serverless Lambda step in AWS, Azure Function and Logic Apps in Azure. Uh, in a come to auto scaling, uh, you find auto scaling groups in load balancing in uh, VM level. You find VM scale sets in Azure. And when it comes to pass, you find Beanstalk in AWS. You find App Service in Azure. The names are different, but there are subtle differences, right? And when it comes, especially uh, as I said, scalability, there's a thing called scale set, which you don't find that in AWS. You find a scaling group. This is a bit different, but the only thing is the uh, concept wise, it's the same. Availability, as I said, we have called availability sets in Azure, which you don't find in AWS. Uh, you find 99.95 availability with availability sets. I talked about it. As I said, contain instances similar to ECS and Fargate in AWS, which basically is uh, your containerized architectures, which uh, the server level we manage by Azure, but uh, containers are managed by you. And that's called contain instances. And uh, it's not serverless, it's uh, contain instances, right? Serverless aspect is which, you know, and then, uh, as your function and logic apps, right? And app service is the web hosting stuff, and uh, you can, uh, there are all our paths for friends, and uh, there are as called as your web apps and as your web apps for containers, right? Web apps uh, is not containers, it uh, could be VMs. Uh, if you want to have uh, web apps in containers, that's offering core web apps for containers, right? So that's about the computing. Storage, again, bit different. Uh, when it comes to uh, object storage, we directly use S3 in AWS. It's not very easy to you know, very easy to understand. Anyone, any, any guy can understand that. But when it comes to Azure, it's a bit different. <coughs> uh, <coughs> sorry. Um, uh, when you going to create object storage, you need to create a storage account, right? That's a thing called storage account. Within the storage account, you find, uh, yeah, yeah, this is a thing, storage account. We find multiple components. One is called blob storage. One is called File storage, one is called table storage, the other one called a queue storage, right? You don't find that in AWS. So all these are separate. For example, file storage called EFS, right? Table storage, there's nothing called table storage in AWS. And uh, queue storage, it's again SQS. So uh, there's a architectural difference in uh, Azure, basically. Uh, you can see the multiple components are plugged into a storage component, which is called storage account in uh, Azure which you don't find in AWS, AWS separate. For example, blob this handle through S3, file storage as M3 EFS, and table storage handle through basically in a DynamoDB, and uh, queue storage handle through SQS, right? And uh, so it's different, right? And uh, as I said, uh, when it comes to VM, uh, you find EBS, right, in AWS, uh, but uh, when it comes to Azure, it's called managed disks. So there are things called managed disks and under managed disks, but managed disks are basically uh, persistent storages. Unmanaged means uh, 
uh, is uh, there's a thing called unmanaged, and usually those unmanaged disks are stored in uh, blob storage, which unmanaged means you have to create your own storage accounts and create your own uh, persistent storage there. But at the moment, they have improved that. Earlier, it was the case. Now, they have, they have come up with uh, similar to EBS, which is called managed disk. It was not there before. <clears throat> Just uh, just to showcase that how powerful uh, AWS in when it comes to storage. I mean, EBS is one of their key strengths actually, because they are very good in storage. Their persistency and performance is very high. But uh, when it comes to that, Azure has not come to that level, right? So they are trying slowly to go to that level. Manage this is one of those uh, efforts that they have come to uh, in terms of uh, getting to the persistence to that level, right? Shared service, as I said, DFS. Uh, does the AWS, Azure File Storage, does the Azure. Archiving account backup is similar. It's very similar. And it's, you know, it's really finding to infrequent access, a Glazier and backup. Uh, uh, Glazier for uh, archival. And same is uh, this thing called uh, hot cool. Hot means uh, your normal blob storage. Cool means uh, infrequent access. Archive is Glazier. Backup, backup, same. It's the it's same name. And uh, when it comes to uh, mobile mobility, when it comes to data transfers, uh, you find the, for data box in Azure, you find Snowball in AWS. When it comes to high base storage, it's like uh, a storage gateway. You know, you can plug uh, different on-premise systems, and you can do that. There's a single store, simple, right? And uh, as I said, man, I, I discuss about this stuff, and I don't want to repeat that. And uh, yeah, this queue storage is uh, is uh, it's a bit, it's actually. Uh, Bit different, right? you know, when it comes to decoupling services in AWS, use the SQS, right? And uh, in uh, in Azure, you find queue storage uh, in uh, to do that. But the thing is, uh, there are there's one more uh, uh, messaging you can say called service bus. I have not included that on the slides because it's uh, too many things, right? And there's a thing called service bus, and uh, only different between a queue storage and service bus is queue storage has better you can store so many, so much of. Uh, I mean, if you if you if you want to store a lot of uh, stuff in the queue, you can use queue storage. If you don't have too many stuff to store, then you can use service bus. Service bus is not not only uh, queue service. It, you can work is work as a message broker as well. So two different products uh, actually. Uh, it does the same thing, but the only thing is uh, queue storage is FIFO, uh, which uh, has a long polling. Right, and when it comes to uh, service bus, it's not FIFO, it's not FIFO, right? It's subtle differences uh, uh, you can find. And uh, when it comes to databases, right? In relational, you know, find RDS and Aurora uh, in AWS, uh, but when it comes to Azure, there are multiple offerings, and uh, you can see pass options, IOS options, uh, and all that, and uh, pass is uh, it's called Azure. When it comes to SQL Server, you find uh, it's called it's a pass option. And, uh, and in addition to that, if you want to use MySQL, MariaDB, or Postgres, you can use that. It, again, those are pass offerings. And if you want to, you know, do a lift and shift from uh, on-premise to uh, Azure without any change, you can use that IES option as well. And there is actually, when it comes to uh, data migration, I think Azure is better. You don't find this kind of uh, variety in AWS. You find, but uh, you don't get this kind of flexibility, right? So they are thought about it quite a lot in the database migration aspect. For example, uh, even in past, there's a new uh, new offering called Manage Instance. Actually, uh, I'll come back. To, I'll come to that. So basically, relational uh, databases you find RDS on Aurora in AWS. Aurora is the more advanced option. Azure is uh, basically you have these offerings. In terms of NoSQL, there's a, uh, in AWS you find DynamoDB. In Azure is CosmoDB. Even in Cosmo, I DynamoDB in CosmosDB, CosmosDB is, I think is a bit more advanced when it comes to its offerings. Because there are a lot of APIs, to, you know, even when it comes to migration, you can go through a lot of APIs. And uh, so, as I said, these two, three pass offerings, uh, they defined in the uh, under SQL Server pass, you find three offerings that's called single database, elastic pool, and the managed instance. Single database is so basically uh, it's a pass, it's called DBAS, database as a service. Basically, uh, you don't, uh, you, you get uh, an instance plus a database, right? You have to, you know, you have no control of um, manipulating in data, even database or so, uh, instance. You, have the manipulation only to the configure the database. 
uh, that's the difference between a single database and a managed instance. Managed instance, managed instance basically, you have the control, uh, not only uh, configurations, you have the control of the database as well. That's why it's more like a lift and shift approach, uh, migration approach, because you can just uh, plug and uh, migrate uh, in a database to uh, Azure without any change. Uh, or, or even if you want to do changes, you have, uh, you have the ability to uh, go and uh, do the sort of changes that you want. If you go to single database, you can't do that. Uh, there, there are changes. So it's not easy because you have to do one by one. So, so this managing is a new offering that they have. You know, mainly to you know do the migration easier. When it comes to Elastic Pool, is very important. Uh, it's actually uh, I go I go a bit faster because I had to finish it. Uh, single database, Elastic Pool, single database, the single tenant. The elastic Pool is a multi-tenant. Multi-tenant means basically, uh, for example, if you have microservices project, you have multiple microservices, right? For each microservice, you have your own database. So likewise, uh, you, the main thing about microservices is about decoupling and handling isolation with the CSRP. That means is you basically based on the hits that you get, based on the load that you get, you have uh, you can increase the load, you can scale out and all the stuff. So that is possible through this uh, elastic pool because, uh, for uh, for example, for any type of database, you can have so when it comes to a pool, you can have multiple databases. It's shared resourcing. When you create a database server, you uh, you can within the database server you can create multiple uh, databases and uh, sharing the same resources underneath. That means uh, it's it's good for microservice applications. If you have, I mean, it's a managed service, so it's very easy. You don't find that in AWS. I have not seen it, so it's a very good addition to Azure. Right? Uh, I've talked about it. This is IAS. Actually, you can do whatever you want. When it comes to DevOps. Um, DevOps and monitoring and tools, right? Monitoring actually, uh, you you know about CloudWatch in AWS, right? In Azure, you find and call Azure Monitor, and uh, and when it comes to CloudTrail, there's a thing called Log Analytics. So these are not one to one actually. There are subtle differences, but uh, this is the closest that you can get, right? And uh, when it comes to AWS, you find this uh, code build, code commit, deploy pipeline. You find in Azure, you call DevOps, right? One word. It has everything. And uh, CloudFormation, as you know, this uh, automated resource provisioning in AWS is called CloudFormation. When it comes to Azure, it's called ARM. It is the uh, same thing, only the templates are given uh, the same thing with a different name, right? Uh, there's a thing called Blueprint also, but I have not talked about it. It's actually a bit higher level than ARM. You can even uh, manipulate ARMs through Blueprints, right? And uh, an automated tools, like, uh, you know, find uh, I mean, if you want to, rather than going through the portal, you can manipulate your resources through CLI. You know that you get the command line, you can manipulate. Uh, as you know, uh, AWS recently introduced Cloud Shell on the uh, what uh, on the console, right? Uh, I just run, I'll just show. I, I, I missed the portal. Uh, anyway, I missed the my portal there, so I can't show it. And uh, uh, if you look up the, you can see the cloud cloud shell on AWS. Recently came, I think probably one year ago, and uh, you can have a bash shell on that. You can execute whatever the CLI commands within the portal. Rather than I mean, when you come to CLI in AWS, you just have to install uh, CLI within your. So if you want to connect from your laptop to AWS, uh, sorry, yeah, AWS, you need to install the SDK on CLI SDK and do it, right? You don't have to go through that. If you have a cloud shell, you just in the, go to the portal and you, you open the cloud shell, you can run whatever the command through that. So it's very easy. I mean, you find this cloud shell in uh, Azure as well. And I think Azure is a bit advanced compared to the shelling uh, because it has PowerShell also, right? And PowerShell is a scripting for Microsoft. Microsoft scripting is a native scripting for Microsoft. And uh, Cloud Shell, uh, basically, when you come to Azure Cloud Shell, you find both Bash and PowerShell together. You can uh, execute uh, Bash, not only PowerShell. As you know, the Microsoft is Azure product, so they are more native to PowerShell. But the thing is now, recent times, they are more uh, technology agnostic. They are, they are given more prominence to Linux servers as well. As you know, the Azure has more Linux servers and micro, Microsoft uh, servers. So it's, it, it's a given because servers are much better in Linux. And uh, so they have given prominence to Bash as well. So uh, so that's a good thing, right? And uh, and if you, I, I can show that part uh, uh, because I have the shell with me. Uh, so uh, you can see there's a cloud shell is here and uh, you need to first create it and uh, 
right? This is the shell when you when it opens. Oh, this is AWS. This is AWS shell. Yeah, and yeah, this is the this is a shell, cloud shell. I mean, you can uh, this like the CLI which you find in uh, uh, your command line. I mean, for example, if you want to execute uh, some command in from your local machine, you can do that. I mean, this is the same bucket set. You can do the same thing in Cloud Shell without having a SDK over there. It takes a bit of time because booting up takes time, but I'll go to the other one if possible. Right. Uh, remember that, uh, go and try, and if you know Azure, just go to the Cloud Shell. You can see that you can select, there's a prompt group to select Bash on PowerShell. You can execute any of these commands there. Right. Uh, the, as I said, monitoring has sub entry monitoring service. Log analytics to cloud, uh, log analytics, the DevOps tool, you find uh, board spire pipelines, reports, and test plans, and artifacts. Yeah, the final few slides actually uh, security, right? Uh, when it comes to security, I again think that Azure is in front uh, because uh, they're trying to amalgamate and uh, make it more automated. When it comes to security, there's a nice uh, tool called Security Center in Azure. Uh, but when it comes to AWS, it's fine to go for Inspector. It's, uh, so I, I feel once upon a time, we had a thing called Security Hub in AWS. Now it's not there. They don't support it. But when it comes to Azure, there's a thing called Security Center, which actually quite advanced, uh, which uh, you can uh, do security assessment, and you can do monitoring, and you can even do recommendation. You can fix certain things, right? And there are advanced to call Defender and Sentinel also. Yeah, I'm not, I have not included them here. But there have been advanced uh, services. And you, uh, compared to AWS, I think they're better, right? And uh, when it comes to uh, recommendations, uh, there, there's a thing called AWS Trusted Advisor. In Azure, this is called Advisor. And uh, Firewall, both are same, same concept. Uh, DOS, DDoS Protection, Shield, DDoS Service, same concept. Uh, security management, KMS, KOPOL, same concept. There's no difference in that, right? And uh, yeah, that's one more thing when it comes to which you don't find in uh, AWS called just-in-time VM access. And when you create a VM, and if you want to block a VM, say, say you create a VM and given to some developer, but you want to block, you want to make him to access only for a period of time. Let's say you don't want to access it for two, uh, more than two days. You can block it. You can, you know, that is called just-in-time VM access blocking. You don't find it in AWS. You find it in Azure. Uh, big data final sites and big data analytics. You find this. Uh, I'm not going to detail. You find a set of services which you find in AWS. For example, data warehousing. We find Redshift in Azure. In analytics, Glue for ETL, Data Factory for Azure, Quick Site for AWS, Power BI for Azure, EMR for Processing, HD inside Databricks for Azure, Kinesis for uh, real time streaming, even have for Azure, streaming, Kinesis Analytics for AWS, streaming analytics for Azure. So uh, you can have a look later. I mean, these are the diagrams, very similar. For example, this is uh, AWS Big Analytics uh, data lake architectures. You put into S3, you go to the EMR to processing, again back to the processing S3 and come to the redshift to the data warehousing and come back with quick site. And here, the same thing. Uh, same process, uh, go through the data factory for ETL, then put it to storage and come back to data picture for processing and uh, funnel through scene and analytics for data warehousing. Final uh, thing is ML and IoT, right? Uh, it's, uh, uh, I think uh, when it comes to ML and I think AWS far ahead. When it comes to SageMake is quite, uh, quite old and quite stable, but as you know, machine learning is, uh, is still picking up. Uh, but uh, I would say ML and AI is AWS much superior than uh, Azure. And uh, IoT, both have their own things. Uh, IoT, IoT Hub, Green Plus, IoTH. I think Gaini did a session some time ago. Uh, so I'm not going to detail. So those are the basic uh, uh, offerings that you find. Uh, I hope that you get some, got some understanding when it comes to service offerings and what are the key differences that you find. I mean, when you start doing Azure first time, Right. I was not a sure uh, person for a long time, but I was doing AWS for a long time. But uh, when, it, when, you, when you have one cloud uh, under your belt, it's very easy to get to the other one. Only thing is you need to find uh, the bella, uh, bridge. You need to bridge the gaps. So then only it's very easy to understand. But uh, one thing is uh, both vendors have their advantage and disadvantages. 
for the moment, AWS is leading because they came to market first, but uh, Azure will definitely catch them up. So if you have any questions, you can ask them. I'm sorry I took some more time. Or if you've got some understanding, uh, you can at least you know reference it. Okay, what the services for this one Azure that you can learn from that. But one thing is, uh, all uh, both vendors have services for everything. That's for sure. Thank you. If you have any questions, you can ask. Otherwise, we can wind up. So thank you uh, for coming and being part of this uh, session. And hope you got something out of it. And uh, I'll share this slides. You can use it later. Thank you.